Hi, it's the ECS 460. I apologize that I'm not there with you today. Um, I also apologize this is going to be posted a little bit later than I would have liked. It took me a while to find the software that I could use that would allow me to record my lecture. I think I got it now. Hopefully this will be on YouTube and I'll send out an email for you all. So if you are listening to this, by definition, you've received the email. So what we want to chat about today is a topic called Design for Test. And the umbrella for Design for Test is fairly large. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about a few of the techniques used for designing SOCs. And uh, I know using this format you won't be able to a ask questions, but what I would like is that you go through the slides, do your best to understand it. If you have any questions, you can either send me an email or, surprisingly, come to class prepared next Tuesday with questions. So let's go ahead and get into this discussion. So what is Design for Test? Design for Test is a set of design techniques that add testability features to microelectronic hardware design. And what I'm referring to here is that fabricating these devices based in silicon becomes problematic in that <clears throat> you believe you've done your best during the design phase, during the verification phase to simulate and you think it's going to work, but once you commit to silicon, once you commit to the hardware design, things don't always behave exactly the way you wanted them to. And so what designers have found is that by adding hooks, you might say, into their designs that may only be used for the testing phase of the device, it allows them to confirm that the silicon is working properly. So DFT, there are companies that make their livelihood selling features and tools to allow you to add DFT to your design. It's an opportunity uh, for a career if you are so interested in this type of stuff. So the goal is to develop the methodologies that are used to verify the correct manufacturing of devices. They want to make sure that what they sell to the user for the user to install on their board is working properly. I guess a little aside is the horror story from IBM when they developed the Pentium processor. They were using tables inside of the device to implement the multiply and during their verification process they did not check every combination of tables and that device went into production the devices were fabbed the devices were given to the manufacturers who produced the computers the chips were put on the computers <coughs> and sold to the public then once the public started using the devices, they found that the results they were getting back using the math features of the chip were incorrect. And that became a big problem for IBM, very expensive. They had to recall all those boards. They Not only that, they had to redesign their chip. So it set them back as far as time, plus it was a very expensive proposition. So the goal is before you put that chip out on the market, you've done everything you can to convince yourself that it's going to work properly. So tests that are used on the fabricated devices are typically called automatic test equipment or commonly ATE. So what's the objectives of design for tests. The first stage of the application of DFT circuitry is to confirm the correct manufacturing process of the chip. Are there any defects in the silicon itself? So here you may have a perfect verification. If there's something wrong with the silicon when you produce the chip, the chip is still not going to work. 
So the first phase of DFT presented here is how do we root out those problems that may have been introduced by the silicon itself. Functional verification of the design is assumed to have been completed in the development process. So typically DFT testing is not composed of functional tests. So what do I mean when I say functional tests? I mean that let's say you have a chip that's supposed to add two numbers. And so if I want to verify the chip working properly, I would run every combination of number on one input as opposed to every combination of number on the other input and verify that I get the correct sum in every instance. That would be considered a functional test, exercising your hardware according to its intended use. With DFT, we're not concerned about the functionality, we're concerned about the correct fabrication. Specifically what I mean is that we're concerned with the fabrication of the chip, not the design. <clears throat> In the second stage that's presented here, it's once we take those chips and solder them to a board, then how do we know that our system still works, that we have not introduced any errors into the system in the fabrication process. And there are other tests that we'll introduce as well. So we're going to break this down one step at a time. So through our study of the SOC development flow, we've seen we have to pass through different stations, design complete, design verification, static timing analysis. Each of those stations are important in that they are caring for a certain aspect of the design. With the inclusion of the DFT capability in a device, we need to insert the circuitry to support the DFT into our design at a certain point in time. There are two choices, but I think primarily the second is the predominantly used approach in industry. The first is that the designers in the design phase include all the DFT circuitry themselves in their HDL. So as they write the Verilog, they write not only the functional design, but they also write in the design that will provide the hooks for the DFT testing. The second and most popular is once you've designed your system, once you've verified it, synthesized it, now you have a net list. Then the DFT tools will come in and you might say post-process the synthesized net list. And what they're doing is coming in and adding structures to the net list by swapping things out and we'll talk a little bit about what that is. So like I said, people sell tools to do that. Uh, from a designer's perspective, you're always concerned anytime anybody touches your design. So even after the insertion of the DFT, you still need to confirm that the logical correctness of your netlist still is correct. So let's go to the next slide. So in order to, so this is a device manufacturing DFT, in order to support the testing of the silicon, at the die level, there's a technique referred to as full scan. And the goal of full scan is to identify defects in the silicon during the production of the die. So what needs to happen is that all of the flops within the design get stitched together into what you would call scan chain. And what's important is that each of the flops in that scan chain have the same reset that allows you to control it easily. And each of the flops in each scan chain must have the same clock. So that way you know when you're moving data from one flop to the next, it'll function properly. So it's the number of flops in a design that will determine the number of scan chains to be created. So you can imagine if you had 
10,000 flops in your design and you connected them all into one scan chain, it would take then 10,000 clocks to fill the scan chain, 10,000 clocks to empty the scan chain. Whereas if you made 10 1,000 flop chains, you could fill it in 1,000 clocks and or fill them in a thousand clocks and empty them also in a thousand clocks. So there's a trade-off there and the primary trade-off is time on the ATE. ATEs, the test equipment, are very expensive and so typically the designers will have a constraint put upon them by the foundry how many clocks they could utilize because they want to get these things off and if you want to exceed that you're going to pay for it dearly. So the last diagram shows when we built our design we used the plain old D flop we should all know and love that symbol by now and on the right we see what happens there is a substitution that takes place and a mux is inserted on the front of the flop and these muxed flops the select is the test enable and what would happen is then the one input would be the scan chained path through all the flops. When the test enable is a zero, the zero path would be the normal data input to the flop. So what we're doing is we're taking over our design. We change the complexion by setting the test enable that then allows the scan data to pass into our flop. And we'll see in the following slides exactly what I mean. So the scan chains are stitched together at the start and the end of each chain, by definition, must be made available at the I.O. of the device because it's the external test equipment that's supplying the pattern and verifying the output. It's possible to share I.O. with functional signals since the DFT is only used during manufacturing. And what I mean by that, it's best to consider the LPC 2148 with our pin select blocks where we basically have an I.O. on the device that we can select different uses for. And in this case, what we do is we put that muxing on the I.O while we're in our design test mode we utilize an output for a different function than it normally is in the design so we mentioned that scan chains should always have the same clock should have the same reset control and we use the test select as discussed in the previous slide to decide which mode we're in so this is just kind of a graphic showing how we've inserted the chain. So once you have a design, once I have a net list that all of my flops have been stitched together, now what I need to do is generate the test vectors. And what that is is the stimulus. So the vector has an input and then an expected output. Now to generate these, they may be thousands of vectors. It would be very complicated to do this by hand, so a tool has been developed, not probably many tools, but a tool that is referred to as an automatic test pattern generator, the ATPG, is used to create the vectors. And of course, the input to the ATPG has to be your netlist because it goes in and does an analysis. And the goal is to guarantee that every node in the design switches. So typically the errors that would be caused by silicon not being proper are manifested in what is called stuck at. So a node would either be stuck at 1 or stuck at 0. So with that, the goal of the ATPG test, or the vector generated vectors, is that every node within the system is able to switch. So 
what will happen is then they'll run the vectors, suck the data out, and continuously do that until they've seen every node switching. And it turns out it will be much faster than if they tried to do it functionally. You can imagine, let's say, if you're trying to do a processor functionally, you would have to go through the fetching of instructions and the execution of the instructions. Here we bypass the functionality of the design. All we're trying to do is see if every node within that chip switches. So typically, most companies don't look for 100% coverage. What you get is an asymptotic uh, relationship. The longer you run the test, you're converging on 100%, but you may spend 10 times the time to pick up that final 2% than you did to get to the initial 98%. So most people agree that if you can get to a 98% coverage, good enough they're willing to go forward with the manufacturing of the device. Now, an aspect of full scan or testing for silicon faults is what about memories? Embedded memories are everywhere inside of integrated circuits. And there's a similar need to confirm that the silicon used to create the memories did not introduce problems. If you wanted to use an ATE to test the memory, it would increase the number of vectors because now, in essence, you're having to functionally test the memory. So a technique called MIMBIST, B-I-S-T stands for built-in self-test, has been developed that basically allows the tester to verify the memories at the same time the full scan vectors are being run. So what needs to be done is you have your memory cell. In the design itself, they'll introduce what they call an MBIST wrap, wrapper. And within the wrapper, there'll be a state machine. Once it's enabled, the purpose of that state machine is to then walk through many different patterns, exercising the contents of the memory, and verifying the results they get. So the whole MIMBIST world takes place inside this red world. Nothing here, nothing here. You'll see that they have to put bypass MUXs in in order to verify up to this point, but that's not the point of this discussion. So manufacturers over the years have developed different patterns to look for different types of observed defaults. Uh, those memory patterns are called Marinescu patterns. You can look them up. And it's a variety of things to check for single bit errors, address errors, whatever. So the MIMBIST is a state machine, an engine, able to run on its own autonomously to the world around it. But it is able to report the results back to the overall test controller within the device so they know whether or not they have a failure in a memory or not. Now, we move to the second type of scan. So you'll find that when you talk to people about scan in the sense of integrated circuits and printed circuit boards, uh, there's really two types of scan. There's the full scan that we just discussed. Now we want to talk about what we call boundary scan. This is also referred to as JTAG 1149.1. Uh, and basically, boundary scan is meant to verify that once you've soldered a chip onto a board or chips onto a board, that that manufacturing process has not introduced any errors. So you want to verify that your design is free from solder bridges, opens, etc. And the technique is the perimeter of the device is surrounded by a scan chain that is transparent to the device in normal operations but during test, you can load a pattern in and you can observe what happens when you switch it through the outputs. So typically, there will be a boundary scan cell that will allow you to capture the normal data in, shift data through, observe what's happening on the output. 
And what they'll do is they place these on all the I.O. of the chip. The core of the design remains intact and is not verified during this test. This test is strictly to verify that the chip was soldered onto the board properly and that it's interconnected properly. There is the tap, which is the test access P. And that is the driver. That's the general who can performs all of the testing. So they'll come in, insert these boundary scan cells. Now that allows them to capture signals coming from another chip, shift them out serially. And at the same time they capture them, they may then serially fill and then test again. So let's look at the next slide. Uh, test access port, sorry. Ha ha ha. So there's the test access port. It's configurable. It's got a little state machine in there. There's a little decode that you can see how to program it. State, there's a state transition diagram. The inputs for JTAG are test data in, test mode select, the test clock, a low active test reset, which you'll find out is uh, optional and the test data out. So when I want to have multiple chips, I can connect them similar to this design. And what you'll see is that functionally, the data comes in on a parallel. They could then issue a clock. So first, let's say they fill all of the registers, issue a clock, and then they can verify all of these connections on both of these chips are working properly. So the very first thing they would do, of course, is they verify that their chain is working properly, that every pattern they put in, they can pull out. And so what that means is the software has to know how many flops are in the chain, et cetera, et cetera. So you can get a feel what's happening. This is once the chips are on the board, they fill, they clock, they empty, and then they compare to make sure they get what they expect. We chat a little bit about these. Test clock, test mode select or state, test data in, test data out, and the T reset. Now, to kind of wrap up our discussion here, you are able to utilize JTAG to verify external memories, let's say. And basically, it's a little bit of time consumption but you can fill the registers that are interfaced to the external devices, perform an external write or read, and verify that you're getting what you expected. It's a little time consuming, a little bit of complication to set up, but the capability is there. If off my board, let's say I've got memories that I want to verify, I can then utilize, or even on my board, I can utilize the JTAG to verify the contents of those memories or the functionality of those memories. So many, many manufacturers publish documents on topics relative to their products. Uh, below you see a reference to a document by Atmel, a manufacturer of FPGAs, describing the standard test access port and boundary scan. And I found that very helpful. At, uh, is another source of information that you can use to help understand what it means by uh, design for test. So I apologize I'm not with you guys. I uh, hope everybody has a wonderful Thanksgiving. And if you have questions, go ahead and send it to me. Uh, I know I'm a little delinquent on some of your questions already, but I'll do my best to get to it in the next day or so. So have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and I'll see you guys soon.